The maths formula booklet misses a lot of stuff that I think is essential. So today we're going through every single formula you need to know that is not there. Starting off with binomial theorem, it misses the single most important formula, which is how do you find a term? So when you have a plus b to the power of n and a and b could be x or a number, they'll often ask you to find a term. So for example, the term in a to the power of three, but it could be any term, right? And the formula is just not in the booklet. The formula is n on r, times a to the power of n minus r times b to the power of r. And by the way, this is interchangeable. So you can do a to the power of n minus r times b to the power of r, or you can do a to the power of r times b to the power of n minus r. It does not matter. And in this case, you would have to find that n minus r equals 3 for a to b to the power of 3. You would need some more information to do this question, obviously, but this is just to show you the formula. For those of you who don't know, n on r is calculated by doing n factorial, which is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, etc., over r factorial times n minus r factorial. Then we have the forms of the quadratic equation. Once again, the formula booklet gives us the main one, but it's missing two very, very important ones. The one that's given is ax squared plus bx plus c, but we're missing the vertex form and the solutions form. So the vertex form is a times x minus h squared plus k. And importantly, and this is what most students miss, is h and k are the coordinates of the vertex. So what you can do is you can try and put the equation in this form, and that way you already have the vertex. Because a lot of times IB asks you to do both, so might as well just do it from the get-go. And the second variant is a times x minus p times x minus q. And in this case, p and q are also very important. They are the roots. They are the x coordinates. The next one is the tangent and normal equation lines. So a normal line equation can be written as y minus y1 equals m, the slope, times x minus x1. How does that go for the tangent? Well, for the tangent, we'll have y minus y1 equals f prime at x1, meaning the derivative at the x coordinate, times x minus x1. This is because the slope of the tangent is the, deriv the derivative of the function at that point. And then for the normal line, it's quite similar, but instead of f prime at x1, we'll have one over minus f prime at x1, because remember the normal um, and the tangent have inverse slopes, right? They're perpendicular. Next up, we have asymptotes. Once again, the formula booklet completely misses this. So remember, a rational function is in the form ax plus b over cx plus d. And if it's not in that form, and that happens often in IB, make sure to change it to this form before you calculate the asymptotes. But then it's super easy. For the vertical asymptote, we need to make the denominator zero, meaning cx plus d needs to equal zero. If you basically move this around, you get that the vertical asymptote is x equals minus d over c. It's that easy. And then the horizontal asymptote is even easier. It is y equals a over c. That's it. So as long as you make sure that your rational function is in that form, you're good. Next up, we have transformations, um, a topic that a lot of students uh, find really difficult, in part because it's not in the data booklet. So let's go through each of them. So when you have y equals fx plus a, that is a vertical shift upwards. If it's negative a, it is downwards. Then we have y equals f of x plus a. So the a is inside the brackets. That is a horizontal shift to the left. If it were minus a, it would be to the right. I always say horizontal works against logic. It works the other way around. So you would think it's to the right, but no, it's to the left. Then we have stretches. So we have y equals a times f of x. And this is a vertical stretch times a. So if it's three f of x, it's being stretched by three. And then we also have y equals f of ax. So again, the a this time is inside the brackets. And because it's horizontal, it works the other way around. Meaning instead, if it's f of 3x, instead of stretching times 3 horizontally, it actually stretches by a third. So it basically contracts by 3, right? And then we have the reflections. So if we have y equals minus f of x, that means that all the y's are shifting. So it's actually a reflection on the x-axis. On the other hand, if we have y equals f of minus x, all the x's are changing sign. So now it's a, re now it's a reflection on the y-axis. That's all you need to know. Remember all of these. It's vital. Next up, we have cosine and sine values. Ugh, this one irks me because it's so annoying that you have to remember. But you need to know the sine and cosine values for the angles of 0, 30, 45, 60, and 90. Luckily, you don't need to remember all of them separately like most students do. There is a table that you can use as a memorization trick. So you first start by writing sine and cosine after sine. Then you're going to write the different angles. So 0, 30, 45, 60, and 90. And then you're going to write, as you can see on the screen, an order 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 for the sine and 4, 3, 2, 1, 0 for the cosine. Okay, 
and that's it. Now, to get any value, what you do is you do the root of this over 2. What do I mean by this? What I mean is you can literally pick any value. So if you want the sine of 45 degrees, you see that it's a 2, so you do root of 2 over 2. That's the sine of 45. If you want to do the cosine of 60, you do 1, so root of 1 over 2. This goes for any value. Next up, trigonometric functions. So the formula, remember, is a of sine or cosine, uh, brackets bx plus c, brackets plus d. These are all different transformations, really, that can happen to the trig trigonometric function. It's just framed in a different way. What you need to remember is the amplitude is a. It's the absolute value of a. So even if a is minus 3, it's still going to be 3. This is important because, remember, the amplitude is the length from the middle of the function towards the top or the bottom. And the period is the length um, basically, which it repeats itself again, because remember, these functions repeat themselves over and over. So the period is how long does it go before another repetition begins? And the period, again, there's a formula for this. It is 2 pi over b. That simple. Outliers. How do you know what's an outlier and what's not? This is skimmed over so much, it's not in the booklet either. So remember, you have q1, you have q2, or the median, and you have q3. Then you also have a minimum and a maximum range. But outside those ranges, you can have outliers. At what point do you go from it being part of the actual data set to being an outlier well there's a rule that you need to know basically you can calculate 1.5 times the iqr remember the iqr is q3 minus q1 and what you then do is you calculate that value 1.5 times the iqr you then do q3 plus that value so plus 1.5 times the iqr anything above that is an outlier you then also do q1 minus 1.5 times the iqr anything less than that is an outlier next we have the fair game something again that's very often skimmed over so this is when we have a distribution as such, a random variable distribution. So x can be 0, 1, 2, 3, for example. But it could be anything. And the probabilities, again, anything. I'm just making up a scenario. And remember, the mean in this case, the e of x, is you basically multiply every value of x times its probability, and you add them up. So 0 times 0 0.2 plus 1 times 0 0.3 plus 2 times 0 0.1 plus 3 times 0 0.4. Um, and it is a fair game if e of x equals 0. Let me explain. In this case, e of x, we're going to add all of these up. And what it's going to give us is it's 0 0.3 plus 0 0.2 plus 1.2. So a total of 1.7. So this would only be a fair game if the cost of entry into the game were 1.7 euros, dollars, whatever this is, right? If it costs more, it is unfair. If it costs less to enter, then actually it's beneficial to the individual playing. That's what we mean there by fair. And last but not least, the area between two curves, once again, not in the data booklet. So we have two curves as such. The area between the two curves is super simple to calculate. It is the integral of one minus the other, so f of x minus g of x, for example, but super important. The one that goes first, so if it's f of x minus g of x, f of x must be on top, meaning f of x is the function that's above the other one. That is very important. And then the integral is a definite integral, and the boundaries are the two intersections, the x-coordinates at the two intersections um, of the area you're trying to calculate. Again, something important to know. So that's it. Any questions you have or any new formulas I forgot about, leave them in the comments, and good luck, everyone.